The first 15 games of the PBA World Championship take place as they have so often over the past 15 iterations of the World Series on the cheetah pattern. How to describe the 2024 PBA Cheetah Championship in one plural word? Strikes. Well, for the contenders anyway, and there are plenty of contenders after the five game opening round. so I got out of that. Um, got lucky with a couple breaks there for, for this 250, so uh, really just uh, not overthinking it. That's, that's mine. Just get my hand in the right spot with the, uh, with the urethane ball, and then uh, you know, I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for when this ball goes away, and that's why I tried a different ball there in the field, just to see, uh, see what's gonna happen after this this urethane ball goes away, which I assume is going to be pretty quickly. Three players manage perfection in round one. Eric Jones rolls 300 in game three. Tim Foy Jr., also in game three, posts a perfect game. Justin Knowles closes the block with 300 to put him into second place through five. I think a little knowledge of the center helped out a lot when we were making the big jumps. Uh, drilled a new black hammer before at the start of the week, before even the practice session yesterday, just kind of had a feeling it would be the one and worked out pretty good that block. Matthew Russo starts with an 8-0-3 set. A 248 and 257 finish put Russo on top of the leaderboard a third of the way through qualifying. Keeping it simple, doing my own thing and just, you know, following the pairs, just manufacturing good shots and staying patient. And if they fall down, great. Uh, just make the spares and uh, just keep going. Well, I mean, it's always big picture. You always got to be thinking about accumulating as many pins as possible. Uh, obviously, I, I need to <laughs> try to uh, try to get some more pins, obviously, to not completely put myself uh, you know, deep in the field for the World Championships. But, you know, if you look at the cut right now, normally it's always about two and a half times, roughly, whatever the first one is when there's three rounds. Yeah. So, you know, that puts the cut at 550 to 600 probably. Done it before. Uh, I'm just gonna have to strike a bunch. You know, I gotta average 250 the rest of the way to have any chance of this. So it's doable. You know, I didn't completely bowl myself out of it. Bowled a couple of good games. Just gonna find some a uh, little bit different reaction and throw it a little bit better. Defending champion EJ Tackett manages a 298 in Game Three, but he still sits in 53rd with his chances of winning back-to-back -back Cheetah Championships dwindling. I did throw it in the gutter in the 10th, the last game on a big string. Uh, you know, finished 249. I didn't think I'd be close to the cut. Uh, not really too worried about that. I got 40 more games to bowl. If I make any of these cuts, that's a bonus for me. Troop starts with 279 and finishes the round in 41st place. The second five game block features nine 300 games. Who's up for a nano box? Two of those 300s happen on the same pair while Zach Tackett nearly adds a third. Francois Lavoie is perfect, as is Cody Shoemaker, who rolls his first career PBA 300 game. Here's what Marshall Kent had to say before the round. I got no idea. I'm changing balls. His huge block, closing with 300, has him in second place after 10 games. Here's what he has to say after the round. Just saw the lane really well. I followed transition real well. I felt comfortable with how I was throwing it. Um, you know, kind of just everything being 
put together very well, and hopefully we do that five more games tomorrow and see what happens. Meanwhile, Justin Knowles starts round two with a 208, then fires 289, 257, 256, and 268 to take the lead entering the final round of qualifying. One win in match play, and you're guaranteed on the show, at least the five seed, and the two wins, and you're the one seed. So it's uh, vital. I think everybody here is uh, chasing that one seed. So that's definitely what ran before this morning. With five more games to determine the top 16 for bracket match play, Knowles stays precisely where he was, in the lead. Of the top 16, after two rounds of qualifying, 12 advanced to the bracket. Four, Graham Fah, Matthew Russo, Zach Tackett, and Dick Allen are supplanted by Nate Purchase, Matt Zwig, Dio Bernard, and Alec Keplinger, whose 258 in the final game of qualifying get him inside the cut by a mere two pins. The round of 16 in best of five match play is quick for six players, three of whom advance. William Svensson, no relation to Jesper, doesn't let Eric Jones, no relation to Tommy, have a chance as Svensson takes three straight. Game two is close between Shoemaker and Zwig, but otherwise Shoemaker outstrikes Zwig and claims the three-game sweep. One more sweep, Mikey Slaybaugh over Nick Payton, comes with plenty of strikes, but as an extra flourish, Slaybaugh throws this in. We're gonna keep rolling into the next match and see what we can do. Dio Bernard falls to Rick McCormick's 279 in Game 1, but then comes back with three straight wins, including rolling a 279 of his own, to advance. BJ Moore, last year's runner-up in the Cheetah Championship, takes out Darren Tang three games to one. squirrely um, game three there so I get a little too quick so as long as I stay stay within myself and we'll put up a good fight. The top seed Justin Knowles rolls 278 in game one but that isn't enough to beat 16th seeded Alec Keplinger's 279. Knowles takes game two but it's all Keplinger in games three and four. Marshall Kent was on the verge of elimination in Game 3 after being decimated by Jesper Svensson's, no relation to William, 278-276 start. But not a session tonight. Then Kent gets a break. With a reprieve, Kent and Svensson battle in Game 4. Kent forces a deciding game. I mean, I threw a lot of good shots leading up to that point. And I mean, you know, a win's a win, but I, it's not one I feel great about, to be honest. If I'm gonna be completely honest with you, you know, like, yes, we're bold. 
phenomenal and I don't feel like I deserved it, but you know, that's just part of the game. It's I've had I've been on both sides of it. So uh, we got 30 minutes. I'm gonna try to regroup mentally and you know try to get back to throwing some good shots. I feel like I threw great that match. It just like I said, two shots I really wish I would have thrown better when I needed it. I also don't feel good about it. He's probably one of the best bowlers. A lot of kids idolize the game after him. But you know, he's human. Everyone's human, so just gotta capitalize on his mistakes, take him one shot at a time, and just bowl my game and have some fun with it. Look, it's very flattering, but at the same time, it's insulting because it means I'm old. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I think it's it's really special. I mean, I remember when I came out here on tour and I had to bowl a heads-up match against Norm Duke, and it was one of those moments for me that was motivating and inspiring and just surreal to bowl against Norm. And if I can offer that to Nate or to someone else, knowing how special it was for me and Norm, um, you know, I, I, I value that very much. Doesn't mean I'm gonna go easy on the kid. I'm gonna try and make it as hard for him as possible as Norm did for me. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very flattering moment. One other match to go the distance sees rookie Nate Purchase and 2009 Rookie of the Year Jason Belmonte tie at 236 in Game 1. Belmonte takes the roll off and, why not, Game 2. But then Purchase strikes, a lot. Two forty six, two seventy six, two fifty six, and Purchase eliminates the seven time PBA player of the year. Just breathe. That's the big key. Uh, I felt like I was doing that really well the last three mat last three games against Belmo and ultimately it helped me with my success. I didn't let the bad shots get to me like I had an open in the four frame and ultimately just battled back, basically struck out. So it, it's pretty cool right now. It's, uh, it's pretty surreal just to be one of the guys you looked up to as a kid. But you know, job's not done yet. Got some work to do and I'm back at it in 30 minutes. Purchase gets fellow rookie Keplinger in the round of eight and one of the two will be making his first PBA Tour televised finals appearance. It goes to a fifth game, with neither player having bowled higher than 235 in the first four. Then Keplinger rattles off at 275, and he's in. From grinding my way through PTQs every week, and then making it through this one, which is a big one. Um, feels great to be able to capitalize on it, and actually, because the other PTQs I made it through, I didn't really do much good there, so it's nice to be able to move forward and capitalize on making it through. Dio Bernard introduces himself to William Svensson with a 277 to take game one. Then, because that wasn't enough, a 300 in game two. Benson takes a low score in game three, and then we find ourselves in the 10th frame of what would be the clincher for Bernard. Uh, it's it's unbelievable, really. I uh, I didn't expect to come this expect it to come this fast. Honestly, I was just, just glad I made the PTQ this week, and I just I don't know. It's it's really the, the I'm just speechless still. Like I'm my mind is running a hundred miles per hour. So this is like the greatest feeling of my life. So.
Mikey Slaybaugh rolls 268 to take game one from BJ Moore, who retorts with 258 in game two. Dropping another 10, Slaybaugh takes game three with 248, then ruins the pattern by piling up a 255 in game four to advance to his first telecast. It, it's been a dream, obviously, and you can go out and compete on the regional tour, and we're lucky enough in the Central to have Graham Fa and Matt Sanders and EJ Bulls these events, so it's cool to get like a glimpse, but to be here and to be in this moment, man, it is, it is incredible. So, but yeah, they definitely, they get you ready for this, and, but the moves here are bigger, they're faster, the guys are just so much better, and it's, it's cool to be a part of it, and it's insane to say that I'm sitting here ready to bowl, ready to bowl for a title with them. I have this uh, practice routine. When things are really bad, I'll just say, okay, you need three in the tenth. I don't know what for, but you need three in the tenth. Figure out how to do it. And I've had so many practice sessions where I'll throw three in the tenth, and I'd always imagine what it would feel like to lock up a show or a title. And I will tell you, all that practice doesn't even come close to what that shot felt like out there. It was a lot of years, a lot of time, a lot of patience, and I had so much support from my friends and my family that. That shot meant more than I could ever explain to you guys. Marshall Kent, as the highest remaining seed, is guaranteed a spot on the show, but it's a big difference. If he wins, he's number one. If he loses, he's number five. Then he falls down two games to none to Shoemaker. Kent takes game three, but Shoemaker comes back in game four with a 268, but he's already lost as Kent steps up in the 10th on the front nine. Game five. Kent's win means B.J. Moore gets the fifth seed. Yeah, I would like to, to win my match and, you know, make it that way, but I'll take the second chance. Absolute grind. Um, my opponents bowled really great matches. I just happened to catch more breaks, to be honest. Um, yes, we bowled amazing, but I mean, shooting shot 820 his first three. Um, Cody bowled unbelievable down the stretch, um, especially when he needed eight. He made the shots he needed to, and um, I was just I was just fortunate today. So hopefully that fortune can carry over into Monday. The Stepladder Finals aired April 15th on FS1. Subscribe to the PBA YouTube channel for an upcoming recap of that and all World Series of Bowling 15 competition.